Poems from the Inner Life by Lizzie Doton. Poem number 25, The Prophecy of Vala. Read for LibriVox.org by Kurt from Tucson, Arizona. Given under the inspiration of Edgar A. Poe. The Prophecy of Vala is founded on the Scandinavian mythology. Odin, the great All-Father, is the sovereign power of the universe. Thor, a lesser god of whom it is said, his mighty hammer smote thunder out of everything. Baldur was a son of Odin and Frigga. He was slain by Herder, his blind brother who was persuaded to the act by Loki, an evil spirit, corresponding to the Hebrew or Christian devil. The Valkyrian were the genie of the battlefield. The three Nornen were the fates who watered the tree Yggdrasil, at whose roots it is said that a dragon was constantly gnawing. The Heimskringla was the circle of the universe. Vala was a seeress, or prophetess, who was summoned from the dead by Odin to tell of the fate of Baldur, but on her appearance refused to do so, and to the astonishment of all prophesied the death of all the sons of Odin at the day of Ragnarok, which corresponds to the day of judgment with the exception that it was also the day of reconstruction, or renewal of the world. The prophecy of Alla, as given in the old Icelandic Edda, has been used with perfect freedom to present the idea that good, though apparently overcome of evil, should ultimately triumph. Explanation by Poe I have walked with the fates and the furies, mid the wrecks of the mighty past. I have stood in the giant shadows which the ages have backward cast, and I have heard the voices of prophets come down in a lengthening chain, translating the truth eternal and making its meaning plain. Backward still ever backward, mid wreck and ruin I trod, seeking life's secret sources and the primal truths of God. Tell me, I cried, O prophet, thou shade of the mighty past, what of the truth in the future? Is its horoscope yet cast? Thou didst give it birth and being, thou didst cradle it in thy breast. Show me its shining orbit, and the place of its final rest. A sound like the restless earthquake, a crash like the crack of doom, and a fiery fulmination streamed in through the frightened gloom. I stood in the halls of Odin, and the great All-Father shone like the center and son of being, mid the glories of his throne. And Thor, with his mighty hammer, upraised in his giant hand, stood ready to wake the thunder at his sovereign lord's command. Ho, Thor, said the mighty Odin, our omens are all of ill, for the dragon gnaweth sharply at the roots of Yggdrasil. I hear the wild Valkyrian, as they shriek on the battle plain and the moans of the faithful Nornen as they weep over Baldur slain. A woe to the serpent Loki and to the herder's reckless ruth, for goodness is slain of evil, and falsehood hath conquered truth. Now call thou on mystic Vala, as she sleeps in the grave of time, where the hoary age hath written her name in a frosty rhyme. She can tell when the sun will darken, when the stars shall cease to burn, when the sleeping dead shall waken, and when Baldur shall return. A sound like the rushing tempest and the wondrous hammer fell, and the great Himes Kringla shuddered, and swayed like a mighty bell. There were mingled murmurs and discords like the wailing of troubled souls, like the gnomes at their fairy forges like the bowlings of restless goals. Then out of the fiery covert of the tempest and the storm, like a vision of troubled slumber, came a woman's stately form. There fell a hush as at midnight, when the sheeted dead awake, and even the silence shuddered, as her words of power she spake. Mighty Odin, I am Vala, I have heard your thunder call, I have heard the woeful wailing, sounding forth from Wingolf's hall. And I know that beauteous Baldur, loved of all the gods, is slain, that the evil Loki triumphs, and on Herder rests the stain. But my words shall fail to tell you 
aught concerning him you mourn for the leaves that bear the record from the tree of life are torn and while hecla's fires shall glow or the bubbling geysers flow of his fate no one shall know understand you this or no i will sing a solemn saga i will chant a runic rhyme weave a wild prophetic edda from the scattered threads of time know o odin mighty odin that thy sons shall all be slain where the wild valkyrian gather on the bloody battle plain and thy throne itself shall tremble with the stern resistless shock which shall rend the world asunder at the day of ragnarok other stars the night shall know from the rock shall waters flow and from ruin beauty grow understand you this or no vainly shall the faithful nornen water drooping igadrasil for the wrathful restless dragon at its roots is gnawing still loki's evil arts shall triumph herder's eyes be dark with night till the day of recreation brings the buried truth to light then a greater god than odin over all the worlds shall reign and my saga's mystic meaning as the sunlight shall be plain out of evil good shall grow doubt me not for time shall show understand you this or no fare you well i go i go there came a voice as of thunder with a gleam of lurid light and the mystic vala vanished like a meteor of the night then i saw that the truth of the present is but the truth of the past but each phase is greater and grander and mightier than the last that the past is ever prophetic of that which is yet to be and that god reveals his glory by slow and distinct degree yet still are the nations weeping o'er the graves of the truth and right lo i summon another vala let her prophecy to-night with the amaranth and the myrtle and the asphodel on her brow still wet with the dew of the kingdom doth she stand before you now not with sound of many thunders not with miracles and wonders would i herald forth my coming from the peaceful spirit shore but in god's own love descending with your aspirations blending i would teach you of the future that you watch and weep no more god is god from the creation truth alone is man's salvation but the god that now you worship soon shall be your god no more for the soul in its unfolding evermore its thought remoulding learns more truly in its progress how to love and to adore evil is of good twin brother born of god and of none other and though truth seems slain of error through the ills that men deplore yet still nearer to perfection she shall know a resurrection passing on from ceaseless glory unto glory evermore from the truths of former ages from the world's close lettered pages man shall learn to meet more bravely all the life that lies before for the day of retribution is the final restitution of the good the true the holy which shall live for evermore understand you this or no fare you well i go i go end of poem this recording is in the public domain Poems from the Inner Life by Lizzie Doten Poem number 26 The Kingdom Read for LibriVox.org by Kurt from Tucson, Arizona Given under the inspiration of Poe And I saw no temple therein Revelations 21 verse 22 T'was the ominous month of October how the memories rise in my soul how they swell like a sea in my soul when a spirit sad silent and sober whose glance was a word of control drew me down to the dark lake avernus in the desolate kingdom of death to the mist-covered lake of avernus in the ghoul-haunted kingdom of death and there as i shivered and waited i talked with the souls of the dead with those whom the living called dead the lawless the lone and the hated who broke from their bondage and fled 
from madness and misery fled. Each word was a burning eruption that leapt from a crater of flame, a red lava tide of corruption that out of life's sediment came. From the soriac natures God gave them, compounded of glory and shame. Aboard, cries our pilot and leader, then wildly we rush to embark. We recklessly rush to embark, and forth in our ghostly Elida, we swept in the silence and dark. O oh God, on that black lake of Ernest, where vampires drink even the breath, on that terrible lake of Avernus, leading down to the whirlpool of death. It was there the humanities found us, in sight of no shelter or shore, no beacon or light from the shore. They lashed up the white waves around us. We sank in the water's wild roar. But not to the regions infernal, through the billows of sulphurous flame, but unto the city eternal, the home of the blessed, we came. To the gate of the beautiful city, all fainting and weary we pressed, impatient and hopeful we pressed. O heart of the holy, take pity, and welcome us home to our rest, pursued by the fates and the furies. In darkness and danger we fled, from the pitiless fates and the furies, through the desolate realms of the dead. Jure Divino, I here claim admission, exclaimed a proud prelate, who rushed to the gate. Ave Sanctissima, hear my petition. Holy Saint Peter, O oh, why should I wait? O oh, Fons Pietatis, O oh, glorious flood, my soul is washed clean in the Lamb's precious blood. Like the song of a bird that yet lingers, when the wide-wandering warbler has flown, like the wind-harp by Aeolus blown, as if touched by the lightest of fingers, the portal wide open was thrown, and we saw not the holy St. Peter, not even an angel of light, but a vision far dearer and sweeter, not brilliant nor blindingly bright, but marvellous unto the sight. In the midst of the mystical splendor stood a beautiful, beautiful child, a golden-haired, azure-eyed child, with a look that was touching and tender. She stretched out her white hand and smiled. I welcome, thrice welcome, poor mortals. Oh, why do ye linger and wait? Come fearlessly in at these portals. No warder keeps watch at the gate. Gloria Deo to Dom Laudamus, exclaimed the proud prelate, I am safe into heaven, through the blood of the Lamb and the martyrs who claim us. My soul has been purchased, my sins are forgiven. I tread where the saints and the martyrs have trod. Lead on, thou fair child, to the temple of God. The child stood in silence and wonder, then bowed down her beautiful head. And even as fragrance is shed, from the lily the waves have swept under, she meekly and tenderly said, so simply and truthfully said, In vain do ye seek to behold him, he dwells in no temple apart, the height of the heavens cannot hold him, and yet he is here in my heart, he is here and he will not depart. Then out from the mystical splendor, the swift-changing crystalline light, the rainbow-hued scintillant light, gleamed faces more touching and tender than ever had greeted our sight, our sin-blinded, death-darkened sight. And they sang, Welcome home to the kingdom, ye earth-born and serpent beguiled. The Lord is the light of this kingdom, and his temple the heart of a child, of a trustful and teachable child. Ye are born to the life of the kingdom. Receive and believe as a child. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.
Poems from the Inner Life by Lizzie Doughton. Poem 27 The Cradle or Coffin. Ho. Read for LibriVox.org by April 6090, California, United States of America. The Cradle or Coffin, given under the inspiration of Poe. The Cradle or Coffin, the Robe or the Shroud, of which shall a mortal most truly be proud? The cradle rocks light as a boat on the billow. The child lies asleep on his soft downy pillow. And the mother sits near with her love-lighted eyes, sits watching her treasure, and dreamily singing, while the cradle keeps time, like a pendulum swinging, and notes every moment of bliss as it flies. Lullaby, baby, watch o'er his rest, the dear little fledgling asleep in his nest. How blessed is that slumber, how calm he reposes with his sweet pouting lips and his cheeks flushed with roses o oh, god of the innocent would it might last but no thou fond mother beyond thy perceiving the parquet are near him and steadily weaving the meshes of fate which around him they cast lullaby baby let him not wake soon shall the bubble of infancy break life with its terrors and fears shall surround him evil and good with strange problems confound him and as the charmed bird to the serpent is drawn, the demons of hell from his proudest position shall drag down his soul to the depths of perdition, till he bitterly curses the day he was born, the cradle or coffin, the blanket or pal. Oh, which brings a blessing of peace unto all. How still is the coffin, no undulant motion, be calmed like a boat on the breast of the ocean. And there lies the child with his half curtained eyes, while his mother stands near him her love watch still keeping and kisses his pale lips with wailing and weeping till her anguish is dumb or can speak but in sighs he needs not a lullaby now for his rest the fledgling has fluttered and flown from his nest he starts not he breathes not he knows no waking though sad eyes are weeping and fond hearts are breaking o oh, god of all mercy how strange are thy ways yet know thou fond mother beyond thy perceiving the angels who took him are tenderly weaving his vestments of beauty his garments of praise oh call him not back to earth's weariness now for blossoms unfading encircle his brow from glory to glory forever ascending his soul with the soul of the infinite blending great luminous truths on his being shall dawn with no doubt to distract him or stay his endeavour he shall bless in his progress forever and ever the day that his soul to the kingdom was born the cradle or coffin, the robe or the shroud, of which shall a mortal most truly be proud. The cradle or coffin, the blanket or pall, oh, which brings a blessing of peace unto all. The cradle or coffin, both places of rest. Tell us, O oh mortals, which like ye the best? End of section 27. End of poem 27. This recording is in the public domain. Poems from the Inner Life by Lizzie Doughton Poem number 28, The Streets of Baltimore Poe Read for LibriVox.org by Sarah Brown, Essex Junction, Vermont Edgar A. Poe As the circumstances attendant upon the death of Poe are not generally known, it may be well to present the facts in connection with the following poem. Having occasion to pass through Baltimore a few days before his intended marriage with a lady of family and fortune in Virginia, Poe met with some of his old associates, who induced him to drink with them, although, as we are informed, he had entirely abstained for a year. This aroused the appetite which had so long slumbered within him, and in a short time he wandered forth into the street in a state of drunken delirium, and was found next morning literally dying from exposure. He was taken to a hospital, and on the 7th of October, 1849, at the age of 38, he closed his troubled life. The tortures and terrors of that night of suffering are vividly portrayed in the following poem, composed in spirit life and given by him through the mediumship of Miss Lizzie Doughton, at the conclusion of her lecture in Baltimore, on Sunday evening, January 11th, 1863 banner of light woman weak and woman mortal 
through thy spirit's open portal, I would read the runic record of mine earthly being o'er. I would feel that fire returning, which within my soul was burning, when my star was quenched in darkness, set to rise on earth no more, when I sank beneath life's burden in the streets of Baltimore. Oh, those memories sore and saddening, oh, that night of anguish maddening, when my lone heart suffered shipwreck on a demon-haunted shore, when the fiends grew wild with laughter and the silence following after was more awful and appalling than the cannon's deadly roar, than the tramp of mighty armies through the streets of Baltimore. Like a fiery serpent coiling, like a maelstrom madly boiling, did this phlegathon of fury sweep my shuddering spirit o'er. Rushing onward, blindly reeling, tortured by intensest feeling, like Prometheus when the vultures through his quivering vitals tore. Swift I fled from death and darkness through the streets of Baltimore. No one near to save or love me, no kind face to watch above me, though I heard the sound of footsteps like the waves upon the shore. Beating, 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 now advancing, now retreating, with a dull and dreamy rhythm, with a long continuous roar, heard the sound of human footsteps in the streets of Baltimore. There at length they found me lying, weak and wildered, sick and dying, and my shattered wreck of being to a kindly refuge bore. But my woe was past enduring, and my soul cast off its mooring, crying as I floated outward, I am of the earth no more. I have forfeited life's blessing in the streets of Baltimore. Where wast thou, O power eternal, when the fiery fiend infernal beat me with his burning fasces till I sank to rise no more? Oh, was all my lifelong error crowded in that night of terror? Did my sin find expiation which to judgment went before, summoned to a dread tribunal in the streets of Baltimore? Nay, with deep delirious pleasure, I had drained my life's full measure, till the fatal fiery serpent fed upon my being's core. Then with force and fire volcanic, summoning a strength titanic, did I burst the bonds that bound me, battered down my being's door, fled and left my shattered dwelling to the dust of Baltimore. Gazing back without lamenting, with no sorrowful repenting, I can read my life's sad story in a light unknown before. For there is no woe so dismal, not an evil so abysmal, but a rainbow arch of glory spans the yawning chasm o'er, and across that bridge of beauty did I pass from Baltimore. In that grand eternal city, where the angel hearts take pity, on the sin which men forgive not, or inactively deplore, earth has lost the power to harm me, death can never more alarm me, and I drink fresh inspiration from the source which I adore. Through my spirit's apotheosis, that new birth in Baltimore. Now no longer sadly yearning, yearning, love for love finds sweet returning, and there comes no ghostly raven tapping at my chamber door. Calmly in the golden glory I can sit and read life's story, for my soul from out that shadow hath been lifted evermore. From that deep and dismal shadow in the streets of Baltimore, End of recording. This recording is in the public domain. Poems from the Inner Life by Lizzie Doughton Number 29. The Mysteries of Godliness, a Lecture Read by K. Hand The Mysteries of Godliness, a lecture delivered by Miss Lizzie Doughton at Clinton Hall, Monday, p.m., November 2nd, 1863. Phonographically reported by Robert S. Moore. 
for several reasons we must be as brief and comprehensive as possible in our remarks tonight we do not intend to make any great intellectual effort or to endeavor to astonish you with lofty strains of eloquence we simply desire to present to you a few facts in connection with the poem about to be given and we do this under the distinctive title of our discourse the mysteries of godliness as godliness was a mystery in the past so it is in the present and why is it a mystery because men understand so little of the practice of godliness socrates was accustomed to say that a man was always sufficiently eloquent in that which he clearly understood and thus a man will not look upon that as a mystery which is a part of his daily life and with which he has become familiar through experience but as it was in the days when jesus lived and taught or when paul wrote his epistle to timothy so godliness to the great mass of minds remains a mystery when paul penned those words without controversy great is the mystery of godliness god was manifest in the flesh justified in the spirit seen of angels preached unto the gentiles believed on in the world and received up into glory he referred particularly to the life and teachings of jesus we however give to the passage a more comprehensive and extended application if the mystery of godliness was made manifest in the life of jesus because of his divinity then do we say to men of the present day beloved now are ye also sons of god and if the word was made flesh and dwelt in the midst of men in the person of jesus of nazareth so that same word is incarnated in greater or less degree in every human being be he rich or poor black or white bond or free in the same way also everyone possessing a living soul is a manifestation of the mystery of godliness and when a man goes into his own nature when he understands himself when he reads the mysteries of his own being when he looks away from his positive and earthly necessities up to his divine possibilities and sees how vast is the range how infinite his capabilities then he begins to understand something of the mysteries of godliness the church has used this phraseology in the past and knew not what it meant she had the form of godliness and yet in word and deed a in very thought she denied the power thereof therefore it has been in all past time when there were some true and sincere souls in the church who made manifest both by profession and practice that in part at least they comprehended the mystery of godliness which is the highest spirituality not spiritualism and let it flow out into the beauty and harmony of perfect lives the church looked at them with a doubtful countenance there was such a thing as being too holy and the church felt that such lives were a reproach to her self-righteousness and hypocrisy she was not familiar with the manifestation of true godliness and consequently looked upon it as something that threatened her internal peace and the success of her stereotyped plan of salvation therefore it was that the voice of condemnation was raised against michael de molinos fenelon madame guillon and the whole host of quietists and reformers by dim forecasting of the soul and heroic struggling with the flesh and sense they had learned something of that holy mystery it was that which could not be translated into human language it could not be written into books but it was that which was to be felt in the soul and made manifest in the life godliness true spirituality cannot find expression in words and so it must of necessity manifest its divine beauty in the life but what is the idea we intend to convey when we use the term godliness who is god from whose name this word is simply a derivative godliness is the manifestation of his spirit and power in the soul of man yet it is not god who then is he we must look into the lexicon of every human heart to find our reply for each one worships his own ideal of deity according to the revelation of truth which he receives and to the capacity of his spirit to comprehend the old philosophers sought for god in all the external world they also went down into the mysteries of the spirit as far as philosophy could sound its mighty depths and yet they could not fathom his infinite nature although form and an external are necessary to man as a completion of his idea yet when he reasons deeply concerning deity he cannot arrive at any satisfactory conclusions concerning his personality he can only worship him as a principle as a presence and a power man in his insignificance can only look up to that superior intelligence which manifests itself throughout nature 
and worship either in the silence of the heart or in the inadequate articulations of human speech the finite never did as yet compass and comprehend the infinite and before that majestic question which all the ages have sought in vain to answer before that mighty oracle whose essence and nature have never been understood man might as well remain dumb but where you ask shall man find his highest manifestation of deity how shall he know and understand god so that he may attain unto the true mystery of godliness the most of god that you can know is through your own souls your neighbor may speak unto you of the influences which flow in upon him from the great soul of all you can only listen but cannot comprehend unless there is something of the same spirit of the same divine life within you but as you grow in goodness and spirituality you comprehend more clearly the truth which jesus the greatest medium the world ever knew spoke to the ears of men when he said god is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth therefore our definition of godliness is spirituality the influence of god felt in the soul and made manifest in the life of man just in proportion as this principle or power is realized in the hearts of men they approach more nearer unto deity they see more of his perfect life they understand more of his ways they leave speculations concerning his personality and go away to those great generalizations whereby a man's soul grows comprehensive and universal in its sympathies and beholds the operations of the infinite mind in all things thus as jesus was a manifestation of that godliness or spirituality the self-same divine power the divine in the human is manifest in every sentient being and here we approach a mighty truth in whose majestic presence we feel inclined to lay aside our dusty sandals for the place whereon we stand seems holy ground while studying the mysteries of our own being we find that necessarily we worship everlasting truth in whatever form it may be presented we go away from limitations we go away from sects and creeds from tottering institutions and the musty theologies of the past and stand face to face with that fresher revelation of deity in the heart then it is that man feels there are primary and fundamental truths lying at the basis of all philosophy and all religion and only as he builds upon these broad foundations can he rear a glorious superstructure against which all the winds of changing theories and the descending floods of mere speculative philosophy will not be able to prevail as man like one initiated into the mysteries of masonry enters into this lodge of freedom he begins to believe in himself no man can have faith in god who has no faith in himself that is the first step toward the divine you take that step in the secret of the soul when you first acknowledge the divine in the human and confess its supporting influence for instance two men may be standing on the borders of a precipice below there is the deep ravine opposite the other side of the mountain they look far down and see rough ragged points of rocks and far far below the floods boiling white with foam over this abyss there is but one slight frail bridge and that is the trunk of a single tree one man says since we must pass over i will proceed i know that i can go i will go that man has faith in himself he plants his feet firmly he looks upward and passes safely over the second says i do not believe that i can go i fear i shall fall he totters on trembling until he reaches the middle and then cries out o oh lord lord help me so surely as he utters that cry faithless in his own power that man must fall and thus it is with human souls they are standing here in earthly life gazing across the great abyss of the future it is dark and terrible below they cannot clearly understand what fate awaits them but they see the straight and narrow way before them if a man plants his feet firmly and says i can and i will it is the greatest possible acknowledgment of his faith in god that man has stepped upon the threshold of the mysteries of godliness those mysteries will be made clearer and more apparent to his soul as he advances but if with craven soul he says i know not what to do i will wait for god's providences and let them come as they may for of myself i can do nothing if he trusts to the vicarious atonement and an external deity and does nothing for his own salvation if in making oral prayers to the lord of the universe he forgets to worship god in spirit and loses the vitalizing consciousness of the divine within his own being that man will assuredly err 
he will continually go astray for externally he has the form of godliness but practically and internally he denies the power thereof the world today is standing in a certain sense in that same position men are lifting up their hands and crying lord lord believing that they shall thus enter into the kingdom while within their own beings there is a broad region of spiritual reason i we may say by simple common sense have turned aside from creeds and theories and have inquired earnestly of nature and of the god within it is refreshing at times to find such a soul one that believes in the inspiration of the living word incarnated in all flesh and made apparent throughout the universe not a pantheist believing in the manifestation of deity and nature alone and in nothing higher but realizing that the creation is the perceptible and external revelation of deity believing with the german philosopher fichte that there is a divine idea pervading this visible universe which visible universe is indeed but its simple and sensible manifestation having in itself no meaning or even true existence independent of it to the mass of men this divine idea lies hidden yet to discern it to seize it and live wholly in it is the condition of all genuine virtue knowledge freedom and the end therefore of all spiritual effort in every age he who lives and dwells in this idea enters into the mysteries of godliness all divine ideas are exceedingly simple when they are known it is because men are looking too high that they do not receive the living inspirations of the truth they turn away from themselves and neglect to observe the manifestation of the spirit within their own being they look upon their brother man or sister woman and forget to exercise that broad charity which sees the spirit struggling with the flesh or feebly breasting the wild waves of a tempestuous life simply because it was thus constituted and surrounded men commonly judge from their own individual standpoint instead of going away back to the divinity of the inner life and from its pure eyes looking into the heart of their erring brother or sister he who simply criticizes the man and judges him by the limitations of his own life errs greatly but he who looks beyond and behind him sees that there are truths and principles and powers in loving earnest spirits who are endeavoring to make manifest their inspiration through him and although he may be changeable in his nature although he may be erratic and wandering it is only through the excess of power that cannot find an appropriate manifestation through such an organization and such a one was he of whom we speak tonight that erratic genius edgar a poe the mysteries of godliness not of morality as the world understands it confounded him he could see more clearly than most of men he looked out into the vast arcana of nature and his soul trembled before majestic revelation he knew not how to express in any adequate form of speech those great and mighty thoughts which rose and shone like stars of wondrous beauty in his soul he knew not how to give his burning inspirations a manifestation through his life and being edgar a poe was a medium a medium you say he himself would scorn the name and we who knew him deny it but of what was he a medium we do not confine ourselves to that definition of the term given by modern spiritualists he was a medium for the general inspiration which sets like a current of living fire through the universe no special individual spirit wrought directly upon him but he felt the might and majesty of occult forces from the world of causes and trembled beneath their influence he was a medium not to disembodied spirits only so far as mind acts upon mind by the great law of unity and in the same way he was psychologically affected by spirits in the body he had a peculiarly sensitive and impressible nature and in the mysteries of a spirituality which he did not seek to comprehend he was easily wrought upon by the minds around him not but what he possessed self-will not indeed that he lacked that firmness whereby when his soul was aroused he could repel such influences but his nature was so finely strung that every harsh word every unkindly discord grated and thrilled through his entire being so that oftentimes it would seem as though he would beat down the wall of clay to give his spirit freedom and to escape forever from the inharmonious influences of the world from the presence of those by whom he was so little understood it is difficult to comprehend such natures for they are not common but alas for such 
they have no choice but to be denizens of this world and all the rough sharp angles of rude humanity seem continually to wound and irritate their sensitiveness torturing them almost to madness and yet there is a deep strong undercurrent to their lives there is a beautiful spirituality which leads men to perceive that there is a power in the universe which balances all these inequalities and apparent inharmonies of human beings and so although they are set at variance with the world in certain portions of their nature yet they are rewarded in others edgar a poe possessed the power of retiring from external things into the mysteries of the spirit the greatest authors and musical composers the world ever knew were those whose favorite pursuit so completely absorbed them that all external things were excluded and they forgot while their inspirations were upon them what manner of men they were forgot the necessities of the flesh and all the surroundings of their daily lives such men could understand our meaning when we say that edgar a poe lived much in his inner life and there as in the experience of the soul wrapped and inspired bohemian glorious revelations of the sublime and the beautiful were made manifest unto him the common forms of human speech were inadequate for expression therefore he seized upon the secret harmony of words and strung them like flashing gems on the gold line of his thought weaving them into wild strange metaphors oftentimes so bewildering and dazzling that the common mind could only feel the charm without comprehending the mystery like ezekiel in his vision he beheld the wondrous living creatures and the wheels and as they were represented so did he describe them but the mind of the reader must be in a similar state of illumination in order to clearly understand his meaning there were seasons when he seemed to enter into a peaceful alliance with the earth and all harmonious and beautiful things yet when his peculiarly sensitive nature was startled and aroused he turned back to this valhalla of his soul and there he found another element of peace a strange paradoxical peace which comes through the herculean efforts of the soul to clamber up the rugged heights of destiny such peace as is given unto souls when the angel with a flaming sword drives them from the eden places of this world back into the mysteries of their being in order that from their bloody sweat and bitter agony they may ring out great songs of moving inspiration and reveal to mankind generally the wondrous world of ideas and causes which lies beyond the limits of sense and the range of external observation all such are men of destiny they are compelled over the ways which they tread the world looks upon them and cannot understand them men consider them as anomalies and strange inconsistencies as abnormal manifestations of the spirit yet for this cause came they into the world and as poets and artists and musical composers are born with the undeveloped elements of their genius within them so particular souls in close connection with the spiritual world who are continually receiving direct impressions and revelations from the sphere of causes are born such from their cradle and thus the mystery of spirituality or godliness as the world passes on generation after generation is becoming more and more apparent in the lives and experiences of men when we speak of spirituality do not consider that we mean modern spiritualism as understood by the world which has furnished any amount of sheep's clothing to the wolves who desire to prey upon the lambs in the unguarded fold of humanity neither do we mean that inflated spirituality which in its zeal for reform and contempt for ceremonies and limitations rushes to extremes and deceiving itself uses its liberty as an occasion to the flesh but we do mean that living principle which makes itself manifest in high-toned souls whose sublime aspirations exalt the whole life above the common level of humanity it may come out as a fitful and glimmering light but it shows that the divine inspiration is there and all men when they perceive it are ready to acknowledge it as genuine whatever is truly good glorious or divine that which possesses in itself real merit and inspiration cannot fail to find a responsive echo and thus was it with the writings of poe when from the glowing fire crypts of his soul he wrought out with master strokes his raven and gave it to the world men felt that there was the ring of true genius and although it was the utterance of a nature at variance with its earthly surroundings and tortured by its own sensibility yet because of its gloomy grandeur and euphonious rhythm the poem could not fail to be appreciated such natures cannot live long in the flesh they are like two-edged swords which wear upon the scabbard there is ever an unseen hand upon the hilt and finally when the word of command is given the sword is drawn and becomes a most effective instrument in the hand of everlasting truth 
then the individual nature that has so long battled the stormy elements of mortal life first perceives its advantages and in the triumphant exultation which spirits always feel when freed from the fetters of mortality it exclaims o death where is thy sting o grave where is thy victory the diviner spirituality which was obscured by the flesh which was crushed down by earthly circumstances at length frees itself and starts up in all its majesty and glory but the mysterious growth and development of the spirit does not end here perhaps in this connection we may present to you certain points from which you will feel obliged to dissent they may seem like vague theories and wild speculations yet they are truths which you are yet to realize in your eternal experience truths which this one of whom we speak will present to you in repetition tonight there is a power in man which is closely connected with the things of external life and draws inspiration from nature and the associations of his fellow men there is a power also in every human being superior to the spirit and that is the soul or innermost life which is a divine and indestructible principle when therefore the garment of flesh is laid aside when the mortal puts on its immortality the spirit goes forth precisely as it is if it has been under the influence of ungoverned passion if it has striven through mad ambition to attain to some cherished ideal still does it feel that impetus and its earthly longings and aspirations must pass away through a gradual transformation you may dissent from this but the change of the earthly garment does not affect a radical change in the spirit and thus as the spirit of edgar a poe started forth on its celestial journey all that bound him to earth still held a certain degree of influence over him life is one eternal progress and only by progression and the gradual development of his nobler nature could he outlive that bondage in many respects he had loved life and the things of earth in his intercourse with men he could not free himself from the sins which did so easily beset him neither could he restrain that sensitiveness and irritability of nature which so often destroyed the peace of his outer and inner life and therefore he must necessarily outgrow that in higher conditions and under more favorable influences as he gradually attained to a sublimer consciousness of the beautiful and true much of the wild and fitful fire peculiar to his genius departed from him and there came in its stead a majestic flow of inspiration solemn and grand as the music of the spheres he saw that there were harmonious relations awaiting him and as his soul was rich in sympathy and love he aspired to those conditions and he could not rest until he had attained unto them the hindrance to his perfect peace was in his own spirit and he realized it for him it was the commencement of a mighty struggle when the golden bowl life's token into shining shards was broken it would seem then as though conscious of his strength he stood up like a spiritual giant exclaiming i am free at last i am free there was a complete expansion of his being as he drank in the celestial air he could not clearly understand the mysteries by which he was surrounded but he knew that there was a latent energy in his soul which being more fully developed would wrestle with these mighty problems until he had made the solution his own as year after year marking great and important changes in human experience rolled on men who remembered poe as he was said now he rests from life's labor now he sins and sorrows no more but they did not know upon what a mighty battlefield he stood neither could they understand through what fires of purification he was passing but there he stood contending bravely not once losing faith in his soul's possibilities and pressing earnestly forward to the desired consummation and in this he was not alone oh no there was with him a whole host of moral heroes who conscious of their power to win the victory and quickened by the inspirations which they received from that higher state of being were striving by the excelsior movement of the soul to attain to those glory encircled heights from whence they could look calmly down upon the plane of their earthly existence thus it was that as they gradually arose higher and higher in the scale of being he and they could perceive that all sin and sorrow and evil ended at length in blessing and that truths which were dim and indistinct which seemed aught but truths came out into clear and shining light and in their heavens were stars of the first magnitude thus also as he toiled on he became versed in the mysteries of the spirit not in mere moralities for true religion godliness or spirituality is the full free and complete development of man's entire being both in the intellectual and moral 
science and literature art and religion have been separated by mankind because they did not understand the true mystery of godliness but in that higher life one of the first lessons taught to the soul is that all things have their uses even the low animal passions leading man into error into sin sensuality and evil where thereby teach him lessons of wisdom will teach him to avoid the false and the untrue and also that there were rocks and quicksands upon which his bark had almost foundered and which in the future he must avoid whether it be these lower passions or the intellectual and moral still each must have its own appropriate manifestation and as all these capacities for growth and perception belong not to the body but to the spirit so the spirit sweeping away into the great eternity bears up all these powers of its wondrous mechanism with it and the vision of ezekiel is realized for the living creature being lifted up the wheels are lifted up also each organ of the brain has its own magnetic circle touching the one upon another like the mechanism of a watch and all governed by the mainspring which is the eternal consciousness of man the central power of his being this order in the change from the mortal to the immortal is not lost but finds a more harmonious surrounding thus when the spirit has ascended with its increased power with its superior opportunities for observation and investigation of all the truths of the universe it learns this most important truth that not in one direction but in all the spirit shall find its most free and perfect development thus having become familiar with the conditions of the higher life the one of whom we speak realized that it was not in the poetic element of his being alone that he was to find inspiration not in smooth flowing numbers or cunning arrangements of human speech but in the grand harmony of the living whole the perfect accord of his entire being it was necessary in passing forth from the flesh that he should learn this simple lesson he has endeavored by all the powers of his nature to make its application and he has succeeded this night he gives his farewell to earth not that he is to be divided forever in his interest from humanity but no longer incited by restlessness or ambition to express in rhythmic numbers the fiery thought within no longer drawn by the sordid interests of this earthly life he can gaze down upon this lower world and influence the minds of men and still be above them he can still minister as an everlasting truth and living power to the needs of humanity but as poe the individual he is willing to be forgotten his personality as far as human recognition is concerned can end here he cares not that this poor paltry me should be spun out into infinity he says let my soul speak which is the divine power i have realized in myself the mysteries of godliness and know now that i too am divine i have merged and lost my will in the great will of the universe i know now what heaven is it is beauty perfection harmony i would live forever in that celestial air and draw in the vitalizing influences of truth i do not desire to go down to the lowly homes of earth nor to mingle with men in their contentions and selfish interests i know that there is a power guarding and guiding all things and i can trust those whom i have loved or those for whom i have cared in that almighty hand whatever mysterious manifestation of wisdom on the part of divine providence comes to humanity i can say now it is well let the will of that power be done i have then no work to perform for you i have only to carry with me through the vast eternity and open nature that i may receive truths and in passing onward transmit them to those who are to follow after me thus it is with all great and earnest souls the mystery of godliness or true spirituality as an impelling and inspiring power is behind them making itself manifest through their being it also stands before them beckoning them on the way it may be they have natures of steel and fire and that a thought electric strikes upon the heart and sits a mania on the brain but still they feel that power impelling and persuading and finally when they perceive that the grand current of human events is tending toward the great ocean of infinite truth they are willing to let their own peculiarities and characteristic tendencies also flow on in the great stream and so harmony is at length established not only with themselves but all the lesson of poe's life in itself was worth much to humanity in coming time others besides ourselves will dissect and analyze his peculiar nature and present it even as we have to men as an instance of that spirit which was made manifest in the flesh which was seen of angels was preached by inspired lips to humanity 
believed on in the world, and received up into glory. Great indeed is the mystery of godliness, great in the light of the human lives that come and go upon the broad arena of earthly existence. Great also is that mystery, as made manifest in those spirits who go forth from the flesh, and feeling the divine inspiration stirring within them, seek for life, eternal life, in order that they may grow and expand to the fullness of their spiritual being, having within themselves a quenchless thirst for the harmonious and the beautiful. They are true to the great law of the Spirit, for whether in time or eternity, it may still be said that, within the heart of man there is a constant yearning for something higher, holier, unattained, upward and onward from the present turning yet resting never when a point is gained some unseen spirit evermore the soul is urging through childish weakness and ambitious youth and day by day all souls are still converging nearer and nearer to the central source of truth youth cuts a foothold in the rock of ages the hope of fame and glory lures him on his way and pondering o'er the works of ancient sages he catches glimpses of a brighter day alas but toilsome is the way and dreary to him who has no high and holy aim and pausing on life's threshold sad and weary he casts away the laurel wreath of fame footnote these lines with those at the close of the lecture are quoted from one of my written poems and footnote thus it was with poe not clearly discerning the purposes of life he did not bend his efforts to one high and holy aim his nature was wandering and erratic this is also his present view of his earthly life he has cast away his laurel wreath of fame and now upon his brow burning brightly with the glories of the celestial sphere is an olive wreath of peace he stands now as a majestic soul self-poised and harmonious yet he has not lost aught of the brilliancy and fire of his genius. Edgar A. Poe was mighty in the flesh, and in the spirit he is mightier far. His manifestations will yet come to mankind, but not as from the individual. They will speak to your souls. They will breathe in the words of fire from the lips of humanity, as inspirations from the higher life, rather than as the utterances of him who was once known among men as Edgar A. Poe. O, oh, ever thus have earth's most noble-hearted gone calmly upward to their place above and when their footsteps from the earth departed have left their works of genius or of love for aspiration is the mortal lever raising the earnest spirit to its destined height but inspiration only comes from a gazing upon the perfect source of life and light end of poem this recording is in the public domain. Poems from the Inner Life by Lizzie Doten Poem 30, Farewell to Earth Read for LibriVox.org by Ellen Murphy The following poem purports to be Poe's final farewell to Earth. It was given in the city of New York, Monday evening, November 2nd, 1863. 1. Farewell, farewell, like the music of a bell floating downward to the dell, downward from some alpine height, while the sunset embers bright fade upon the hearth of night. So my spirit, voiceless, breathless, indestructible and deathless from the heights of life elision, gives to earth my parting song. Downward through the starlit spaces, unto earth's most lowly places, like the sunborn strains of Memnon, let the music float along with a wild and wayward rhythm, with a movement deep and strong come up higher cry the angels this must be my parting song earth o oh earth thou art my mother mortal man thou art my brother we have shared a mutual sorrow we have known a common birth yet with all my soul's endeavour i will sunder and for ever every tie of human passion that can bind my soul to earth every slavish tie that binds me to the things of little worth come up higher cry the angels come and bid farewell to earth i would bear a love platonic to the souls in earthly life i would give a sign masonic to the heroes in the strife i have been their fellow craftsman bound apprentice to that art whereby life that cunning draughtsman builds his temple in the heart but with earth no longer mated i have passed the first degree i have been initiated to the second mystery oh its high and holy meaning not one soul shall fail to see 
now with loftiest aspirations onward through the worlds i march through the countless constellations upward to the royal arch come up higher cry the angels come up to the royal arch two farewell farewell like the tolling of a bell sounding forth some funeral knell tolling with a sad refrain not for those who rest from pain but for those who still remain so sweet pathos would i borrow from the loving lips of sorrow weaving in a plaintive minor with the cadence of my song for the souls that lonely languish for the hearts that break with anguish for the weak ones and the tempted who must sin and suffer long for the hosts of living martyrs groaning neath some ancient wrong for the cowards and the cravens who in guilt alone are strong but from all earth's woe and sadness all its folly and its madness i would never strive to save you or avert the evil blow even if i would i could not even if i could i would not turn the course of time's great river in its grand majestic flow grapple with those mighty causes whose results i may not know all life's sorrows end in blessing as the future yet shall show from life's overflowing beaker i have drained the bitter draught changing to a maddening ichor in my being as i quaffed i have felt the hot blood rushing o'er its red and ramious path like the molten lava gushing in its wild volcanic wrath like a bubbling boiling geyser in the regions of the pole like a scylla or charybdis threatening to engulf my soul oh for all such fire-wrought natures let my rhythmic numbers toll vulnerable like achilles only in one fatal part i was wounded by life's arrows in the head but not the heart come up higher cried the angels and i hastened to depart three farewell farewell like a merry marriage bell pealing with a tuneful swell telling in a joyful strain with a whispered sweet refrain of the hearts no longer twain so no longer cursed and faded fondly loved and truly mated i can pour my inspirations free as orpheus through my strain gifted with a sense of seeing far beyond my earthly being i can feel i have not suffered loved and hoped and feared in vain every earthly sin and sorrow i can only count as gain i can chant a grand te deum or the record of my pain ye who grope in darkness blindly ye who seek a refuge kindly ye upon whose hearts the ravens ghostly ravens perch and pray listen for the bells are ringing tuneful as the angel singing ringing in the glorious morning of your spirit's marriage day when the soul no longer fettered to the feeble form of clay to a high harmonious union soars elate with hope away where the iris arch of beauty bridges o'er celestial skies where the golden line of duty like a living pathway lies where the gonfalons of glory float upon the fragrant air ye who read life's lengthening story find a royal chapter there ye shall see how men and nations o'er the ways of life advance ye shall watch the constellations in their mazy mystic dance and the central sun shall greet you greet you with a golden glance oh for souls in life eternal let the bells in gladness ring bind the wreath of orange blossoms and the wedding garment bring come up higher cry the angels let the bells in gladness ring four farewell farewell like the chiming of the bells which a tale of triumph tells as the news in tuneful notes leaping from the brazen throats on the startled ether floats so in freedom great and glorious over flesh and sense victorious does the spirit leap the barrier which across its pathway lies greater far than royal caesar fearless as the northern aesir drawn by love's celestial magnet winged with faith and hope it flies upward o'er the starry pathway leading onward through the skies to the land of light and beauty where no bud of promise dies there through all the vast empyrean wafted as on gales hesperian comes the stirring cry of progress telling of the yet to be tuneful as a seraph's lyre come up higher come up higher cry the hosts of holy angels learn the heavenly masonry life is one eternal progress enter then the third degree ye who long for light and wisdom seek the inner mystery thus o sons of earth i leave you leave you for that higher light and my charges now receive you all my parting words aright human passion mad ambition bound me to this lower earth even in my changed condition even in my higher birth but by earnest firm endeavour i have gained a height sublime and i ne'er again no never shall be bound to space or time i have conquered and for ever let the bells in triumph chime come up higher cry the angels come up to the royal arch 
Come and join the past grand masters to the soul's progressive march. O oh, thou neophyte of wisdom, come up to the royal arch. Sons of earth, where'er ye dwell, break temptation's mighty spell. Truth is heaven and falsehood hell. Lawless lust a demon fell. Sons of earth, where'er ye dwell, in this heaven or in this hell, when ye hear the solemn swell of creation's mighty bell, sounding forth time's funeral knell, ye shall meet me where I dwell. Until then, farewell, farewell. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. End of Poems from the Inner Life by Lizzie Doughton.